We're recording. <laughs> and Mojo, uh, our guest this week, obviously. Um, Mojo was uh, in the middle of, Mojo Raleigh, in the middle of uh, an interesting story. And um, please continue, sir. Well, we just had started talking about health insurance and how you fell asleep yesterday during a <laughs> researching process with your wife looking through deductibles and how crazy it is that you, you pay for a monthly service that when you need to use the service, you have to pay more for the service and then you get charged even more for using that service at all. Right. So, I just began to talk about how I, I just got married and my now wife and I. Yep. Yes. <laughs> I'll do it again. I'll do it again. Yes. <laughs> Bravo. We love well, marriage we, on this podcast. There it is, pal. Big marriage loving podcast. Yeah. But we did a four week trip in Europe, a uh, different city every day for the for the wedding and the honeymoon. Awesome. And my wife ended up getting sick while we were in Prague, actually. And I was kind of stressing because I was like, I don't know how to handle this overseas. I've never been to Prague. I'm not familiar with their healthcare system. I don't know what this is about. So we call it we call a taxi. We we go to the emergency room because, of course, it was a Sunday and like a national holiday there. And everything was shut down and we walk in and oh, dude no. the hospital was insane we got bounced around we don't speak the language we don't know what to do they have like a separate wing of the hospital for foreigners uh where you go but you only check in there you check in there and then you go back to the opposite wing to actually see the doctors and i'm expecting like this awful process i'm like dude this is gonna bankrupt us this is gonna be awful mm. we don't even know what's wrong with her Dude, we got back to where we needed to be. We sat there for maybe 20 minutes. We go in. She gets her scans done. We come out. She had all these scans done and, uh, you know, samples taken and all this stuff. $40 it cost us. And we were gone in an hour. That's crazy. Wow. That's crazy. $40, dude. Oh, my God. It's crazy. I mean, you think about it in this country and, like, we are the, you know, the the superpower, the end-all, be-all, etc., and we're just doing it wrong. Like how, how my, my wife told me that she has had this issue before and she went to the hospital in America for the exact same issue. And the end result was the same, same, same meds yeah. they gave her same, you know, rehab process, whatever. She said that she paid like 7,500 the last shit. time for the same thing, almost 10 grand. I don't remember yeah. the exact number. But that versus 40 bucks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that wow. was nuts. <laughs> wow, yeah. wait. Wow. It is. It's crazy. And the fact that, like, um, they can get away with it is um, insane. Like, this is – we're talking about health care. We're talking about, like, keeping people, you know, well and keeping them in, in extreme cases from, like, from death. <laughs> I was, literally, so expensive. I was literally thinking to myself, I was like, the next time I get sick or need scans or whatever that process is, I could buy a first class round trip international ticket, fly all the way out there and still say, <laughs> 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 like, that's, you would. <laughs> that's insane. <laughs> what the hell? I'm going on vacation. Why? Uh, to get my... Um, medical taken care of yeah <laughs> Apparently, so i gotta see a doctor <laughs> it's not that uncommon actually you hear about people needing surgeries and finding a good doctor yeah. in other countries they just hop on a flight go do their thing and come back yeah. after rehab's done yeah yeah i know there's uh what is it like the stem cell and whatnot yeah. has something that people go to germany or mexico for or, you know yeah, it's nuts, man. It is nuts. <laughs> All right. So that sounds like one hell of um, a wedding and honeymoon, sir. Four yeah, weeks. We, we, we swung for the fences on this one. Old Mojo was single for a very long time. And I knew when I finally found the one, we had to 
go all out. I had enough time to save up for it. <laughs> Good man. Good I don't man. want this podcast to come off as like we're burying America, but weddings, another one that played cheaper. <laughs> Somewhere else, man. Hey, if the shoe fits. First of all, again, America <laughs> uh, advancing in the World Cup tournament today. So let's fight. America, America, <laughs> we beat our run. Our run, too. Is that your Iron Sheik? Friend? Iron Sheik. My Iron yeah. Sheik, Baba. My Iron Sheik, Baba. Holy shit. Dude, we literally wow. were filming TMZ today, and the whole office shut down mid tape. So we could finish out the game when they went into extra time, dude. We just we're all watching on our phones from our desks. And the whole office shut down. It was pretty hilarious because everyone was so hyped up. Wow, wow! I missed all of it. I was outside pressure washing the uh, walkway. Yeah, it was an exciting game, man. It was a it was a good one. But you'll have now you get to see us take on um, the Netherlands, uh, I believe Saturday. So that'll be good. Oh, it's a big one. The Netherlands have a good. Soccer team, football, whatever that's, you want to call it. That's yeah. the word on the street. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. not, not as familiar as I should be. Yeah, I'm definitely not either. No. I, I try to stay on top of it, but yeah. Is it part of your job with uh, TMZ? I mean, if you it's, stay on top of that. We yeah, I always try to stay up on whatever's going on in sports, but they also uh. like kind of. We'll see big headlines. We'll pro we'll know what's probably going to be on the show, and okay. um, you know we, re we we recap everything on the show. So even if someone's watching at home and has no idea what happened, we'll give you the full scoop before we get into the color and our opinions on it. So okay. even if I didn't know, Babcock will let fill me in on the show live. So <laughs> my job's the easy part. Babcock I just love the name part. Babcock. Yeah. <laughs> Babs. <laughs> Cock. <laughs> you know, pick your poison. <laughs> one, one will get censored, one won't. So. <laughs> All right. So, um, <laughs> back on track here. Um, so, TMZ is current day mojo. But, Frank, if I'm not mistaken, why don't we rewind this a bit? Take us on a journey, Mojo. Take us to the old time machine where we're going to get to the DeLorean. We're going to go back in time. Talk to us about your early football career because that was that to me is actually where I found, remember you. I remember you playing at Maryland. You were uh, quite the standout there. Was this when you uh, stalked him, Frank? Did yes. The police, the <laughs> yes. um, restraining order? <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, I don't. Can we do this because of the restraining order? I mean, is this uh, okay? well? It's been it's, it's lifted. Yeah. Oh, okay, perfect. Yeah. There's What's the restraining order? Limitations. <laughs> Small cats. <laughs> uh, yeah. Don't worry about it, Mojo. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep recording, Dennis. <laughs> yep, got it. <laughs> All right. Yeah. yeah. So, Frank. Um. Frank, you want to ask that again? No, take us through your um, early football career at uh, the yeah. University of Maryland and even prior to that. How'd you get you, Were you a big stand on high school, obviously? Dude, I went to the high school from the movie Remember the Titans, T.C. Williams. Get out of here. Wow. Yeah, man. And I really? was actually a freshman there when the movie came out so obviously wow massive uproar in the city and that's kind of a funny one because obviously tc you know the year the movie came out or what it's based off of i mean was one of the greatest high school football teams ever i think they gave up either 14 or 21 points the entire season like as good as they looked in the movie it was way better in real life they didn't have a close game the whole year including the state title game um, so like legendary program at the time, obviously everything they overcame with, uh, segregation and combining all the schools, if you haven't seen it, um, you know, there was essentially a white school and a black school back in the day, they put them together and, um, man, they, they found their stride, coexisted and, uh, crushed it. But the sad part of the story is fast forward to when I was playing there, in four years of varsity football there, we won 
four games. I played for four different head coaches. We were the worst program in the state. Uh, we were awful. We got our asses kicked by everybody. I think TC in the movie gave up like, you know, 14, 21 points the whole year. We only scored 14, 21 points a year. <laughs> right. Like the movie came out or the year after the movie came out. So like we played in like eight homecoming games. Everybody wanted to knock off the, the team from the movie. Every team we played, forget the Titans. Remember the Rams, you know, whatever. The <laughs> so you guys were the, um, the Brooklyn brawler of, <laughs> of, of high school football. I mean, you I might be dating really myself with that. Big time. Big time. And <laughs> ESPN just buried us. They, um, they're like, they did a whole front page article spread. They came to football camp with us. They followed us around for weeks recorded everything just so they could put out this front page article about TC used to be great. Now they suck. What happened? Oh, they man. Just, just man, kicking a guy. That's off brutal. Buried us. These are high school kids. Like that's <laughs> brutal. <laughs> We're supposed to be preparing these young adults for life in the world. <laughs> we, we were prepared to, uh, Overcome adversity and handle yeah, yeah. track talk, I guess, early after all. Well, that. don't be afraid to correct my math, but that's one win a year. Um, that's that's a hell of a way to stay uh, humble. We and went, consistent. <laughs> we went one and nine the first year, then we went zero oh and nine the second year. Ooh. We had our last uh, one of our games canceled because that's actually. I don't know if you guys remember the DC sniper incident, but yeah. you know, they canceled a game for that when everyone was trying to, you know, hide from that situation. Yeah. Then yeah. we went two and eight and then one and nine my senior year. And I'll pat myself on the back here. I picked off a shovel pass to take get it some. Get Go some the house to win the game against yeah. the so my man pots of pants. Instead of 0 and 10, and got <laughs> arrival out of the playoffs. So very <laughs> Very good feeling that day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Small victories. You would have thought we won the it. Super Bowl, man. Hell no, we yeah. Just won our first game of the season in the last game of the season. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Oof. Oof. I've been I've been on some uh, you know, some uh football teams that could have fared better. <laughs> I, th I think we were uh my senior year of high school, I think we were a little over. 500 i think we maybe we like, like a seven, seven and three six seven and two three, something yeah. like that yeah, yeah, seven yeah. And three is a good year yeah uh college though um if i remember correctly sienna we we struggled a bit i think we were probably like four and six yeah that's yeah that's tough we didn't we didn't win a lot at least that you might be why the uh, the football program at Siena College has since dissipated. So yes, yes, <laughs> they uh, they and it was a mercy, um, mercy killing. So <laughs> they, they, <laughs> yeah, they just never like everyone on the team's just like, dude, we're not even mad. We understand. <laughs> <laughs> it was just it was like it was the uh, the child nobody wanted. <laughs> It's unfortunate, but yeah. we get it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, so I think they did everybody a favor. But what are you going to do? <laughs> All right. So uh, heavily recruited coming out of high school? Absolutely no. not after Nothing. all that. <laughs> Nobody wanted the guy from that school. <laughs> right. Oh my goodness! It was so. I, I put up good stats too, but it was like, man, I could barely get. I was honorable mention all district. They wouldn't even consider our school for all district honors. I think there was like two of us that won honorable mention for the right. whole, whole school. It's not like there's that many teams in the league, you know. So what? What kind of physical numbers are we talking about at this time, Mojo? Like, are you as big as you are now? Are you much smaller? Did you peak late, early? I was 6'3", 235. I, okay. I actually remember some of these numbers. I think I was second or something. I was, I had 10 sacks my senior year or something like that. I think I was like second or third in the conference. Um, I, had a, I had two defensive touchdowns that year, which was pretty sweet. Um, 
And then, yeah, I don't really remember much of the the other stats, but uh, sure, I yeah, had to go to high school. Just, yeah, that's it's high school, so I mean, <laughs> probably better off that you don't remember. Yeah, if I still remembered all my stats, <laughs> I'd be concerned about what happened after. <laughs> there you go. You probably wouldn't be married right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm that I'm that guy at the freaking uh, Thanksgiving pre Thanksgiving meetup, you know, with all your buddies <laughs> talking about high school football back home. Hell yeah, don't want to be yeah. that guy. So Mojo, um, you went to, if I'm not mistaken, a D three yes. school to start. Okay, that one was a cool one because um, it was actually a really good academic school back home in Virginia, Christopher Newport University in Virginia Beach. Very strong academic re- uh, reputation. And it was a brand new football. It was, you know, I think it was like two, three years old at the time, but it was a new football program um, that was a great program. I think they were the first ever team to win the conference in their first year of existence, which was their claim to fame. Pretty cool thing. Um but yeah, they wanted to recruit me. I made my decision late. I mean, obviously, I was trying to hold out to see if there was any D one interest. Yeah, uh, couldn't couldn't get there, um, and so I went the D three route. And I was fortunate enough to go on a full academic scholarship, and uh, it was really a good situation. I start. I was like, I started as a freshman. I, I was like a awesome. freshman captain, and you know, broke a lot of weight room records. The school had me plugged into the the leadership program and the honors program and the executive board of the business school and yada, yada, yada. But um, as much as I loved it there and I had a great time, uh, I just really wanted to go to the big leagues and try my luck at D1 school and see what that was about. I felt like if I stayed there for too long, I'd run out of challenges and I'd never have a shot at the NFL, which at that point was, Right. Just like, you know, something reaching out there in the stars, like a shot in the right. dark, trying to trying to make that. But uh, still wanted to at least have the opportunity. So gave up the full ride and walked on at Maryland, paying thirty five grand a year to go to school when it was Ooh. 20 minutes from my house. I lived literally the first city on the other side of the border from you know Maryland and Virginia, but still out of state so had to pay yeah. like triple tuition for it which sucked but, oh my uh, yikes yikes well you were is, all right is everybody everybody seated are you ready for it i just want to make sure everybody's sitting down on this one you were the proverbial big fish in a small pond <laughs> hey <Hey-oh. Hey-oh. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> There it is. Well, and the big fish, because of these kind of numbers, 225 on the bench press, 36 repetitions. Is this accurate? Yes, that Ooh. was at Maryland. Yep. Good. Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, power clean of 390. Yes, sir. Good that was, that was Lord. Favorite. That's that's 400 pound power clean. So the power clean to me is is one of the more athletic looking uh, lifts that anyone can can do. Um, man, to see it's such a dynamic lift. So for it to for a bar to have that much weight on it and to be moved in such a dynamic uh, movement, that's that's freaking impressive. That's probably. I mean, I don't know which one impresses me more, but that one's up there. Uh, vertical leap, 36 and a half. Yes. Okay. Big numbers, so guys. Step hops. Yeah, yeah. And um, pro agility, a 437. Yeah, yep. The 510 five shuffle. Yep. That's moving. And then uh, 40 yard dash, a 47. Eight. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. This was, Damn. I think I was weighing. That's some numbers, boy. 295, 300 at that time. So that was at Maryland. Shit. And that again, being a walk on, man, it's like they have their coaches are paid a lot of money to go out and scour the country for recruits. So yeah. when they put their name on a recruit, it's like their guys got to pan out or else they're going to yeah. be fired. Like that's half their job it's not only to coach it's also to recruit so when you come in as a walk-on 
they don't want to see you succeed. I mean, they're sure. happy and for you to be a practice guy and push the pace, but right. every roster spot a walk-on takes or a starting job a walk-on takes, it means one of their guys, you beat out at least one of their guys to yeah. have that job. So they really, you're not their preference. You're kind of right. like back of the line. You have to, you know, you can't have a bad play because you could may have one bad play out of 10. Their guy can have nine bad plays out of 10. They're still going to, you know, kind of run with their bet, their guy usually. So it's, right. uh, we had to have the, we had to have the numbers in the weight room. We had to have the academics and the grades. We had to get it done on the field. Yeah. Like we could not give them a reason whatsoever to go with somebody else. Sure. I mean, it makes, it does, it, it makes sense. It's, it's far from fair. However, you know, college football, major college football, it, it's a business. Yeah. You know, it's like anything else and it, and it's a business and this is uh jobs and, um, so yeah, I mean, logically it makes sense. Um, I, I will say it seems as if, okay, one more time, everybody sitting down. <laughs> okay. You were swimming upstream. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's never ending. Dude, I hope these keep coming on. <laughs> already my favorite part about this. <laughs> but I would say then, Mojo, and correct me if I'm wrong, that sort of um, difficulty in, in as far as a scenario and whatever, do you look back at it now with some perspective and go like, okay, that's kind of what made me who I am like that. They, these are some of those moments where, you know, at the time, yeah, they're difficult, but that's, it's usually the other end of that stuff is where, where the, the value is. That's the good stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Those are lessons that pay dividends. I mean, you appreciate it then when it happens and when you look back on it later, you know, even if times get tough later, you remember all the things that you survived and you're overcome. And it's like just that confidence boost you need to, to keep pressing on. But that's, that's always kind of been my MO, just being that kind of walk on undrafted kind of player and mm -hmm. coming in with lots of energy and trying to do everything I can to, to figure it out and sort it out. And I would take that path and all that hardship over being the guy that came in as the highly touted that didn't have sure. to suffer and dig through that even if both guys end up in the same place I'd, I'd rather be the dude that had the the tougher path for for my own sake now yeah was one of the gronkowski brothers on that team too two of them actually. two of them <laughs> yeah so that's how i met those guys um dan gronk was uh a tight end for us and he was there my whole run uh he got there a year before i did because i transferred in after two years at cnu but uh Chris Gronk was there as well. He was a fullback, but he was only there for one year. His The situation wasn't in his favor at Maryland, so he transferred to Arizona. Also, when Rob was going to Arizona, and Chris actually killed it there. He played football and baseball for him and then made it in the, in the league as well. So got oh, to nice. play with both Dan and Chris in college. That was pretty fun. Uh, very cool. Nice. Very cool. And you're still pretty tight with those guys to this day, yeah? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I awesome. To Chris. Chris and I do a podcast together, and uh, we bury each other on social every day. <laughs> so it's, it's a fun rivalry. Yeah. <laughs> what, I mean, really, what are friends for, if not to bury one another? Exactly. You're going to compliment each other? Come on. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, Frank, where are we uh, where are we headed on the questions here? The men's room. No. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, okay. Right in the shitter. Perfect. I, I got bathroom stories. Yeah. Whatever you, whatever you want to talk about. Plenty of bathroom stories. I mean, that'd be a hell of a podcast, guys, if we all did one from the shitter. <laughs> that has no one ever done that before. No. I don't know. That's we a good idea. First, we that's could. actually a brilliant idea. I think. On a plane. How about if we all did it on a plane? That's not weird at all. That won't, be, <laughs> that won't be awkward at all. No, no. What if we just did it in, you know, sequential toilets right next to each other in the same uh, room facing each other? There we go. <laughs> now it's maybe getting too much. Maybe That's it's a little weird. That's a little weird. Well, That's a little I mean, weird, Papa. <laughs> oh, boy. 
<laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, all right, Frank, out of the shitter. Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> where to here? <laughs> Let's go to the NFL. Why don't we go to the NFL? Okay. From the to the NFL. Why don't we? <laughs> <laughs> so, Mojo, was that kind of always your uh, end goal? Was it was it the NFL? Um, it became that. Truthfully, I actually wanted to be in the WWE first. That was the first thing I I watched. The uh, first thing I wanted to do. Really? And I guess the way I always say it is, you can't sign up for professional wrestling in grade school, so. <laughs> you sign up for what you can actually play and you know football went well and i just stuck with it and wrote it out and um, okay well at the risk of um getting out of order here i i have to ask so then you were a big fan growing up of pro wrestling obviously yes hulkamaniac brother my guy was the ultimate warrior back in the day yeah that, that was me if you can't can't tell got a little in common common with that guy but me my dad and my brother every every week every every monday man we were huddled around the tv watching all right wrestling doing moves back then i had no idea that w you know wwf you know whatever uh and wcw were different companies i just assumed it was like football where you got the tampa bay buccaneers you got the carolina oh. buccaneers. it's just different you know franchises within the same overarching okay so i didn't even so understand until what that. age did you start watching i mean Probably as early as I can remember. Really? Really. I mean, oh, I, okay. as a as a young kid, big time. And then when when I was in like middle school, high school, like at school, we would mess around and like hit each other with moves and get detention and crap like that, uh, which I know so many people have that story. But right. I, I, I was really big into it until then. And then truthfully, when I when football started taking off with college and pro, it yeah. just be all in with it and I that's got to be your focus yeah i, I stopped I, I mean i watch from time to time but i i barely okay. kept up with it during that time and the same thing when i got to when i got to wrestling i just stopped watching football and you know it was yeah. in the background fine but i never like sat down and like watched the full game ever okay well that that kind of gets us back to uh to where we were then so we'll hold on to the idea that warrior was your guy we'll come <laughs> back to this um but let's uh, flip back a page. Um, all right. So leaving Maryland, NFL becomes the goal. Off we go. How how does how does this fall in place? So I had, um, you know, I walked on my um, uh, my first year. So I had to sit out at Maryland. I played a couple of years. Had a pretty decent uh, senior season. Um, but I knew for me, the thing that was going to be my biggest selling point was the numbers that you mentioned earlier, going in on yeah. the pro day and just wowing the scouts with, you know, strength and athleticism and, you know, hope that that would make up for, you know, me being a division three walk on and only having two years at Maryland of playing time. And, uh, you know, with even, you know, one year of full time, you know, the year before was kind of like off and on. Um, I knew I had to kill it. Problem was, is I like tore my hamstring like six days before my my uh oh, shit. training yeah, actually all of it. my injuries i've ever had never really came on a football field or in a wrestling match it was always in training but usually in working out for those um right. you know the matches from over training because i train my ass off and i never know when to stop i feel like if i stop i'm being a wuss and i need to yeah keep it moving so i i didn't i wasn't able to run i wasn't able to do my drills um i did a very limited pro day while injured and um you know that was kind of like my hope to be drafted so i didn't i didn't get drafted i was sitting there watching the whole damn thing like an idiot a right stressful thing um so you couldn't really test and this is what you were banking on being the thing that gets your foot in the door so would you say like with the NFL, sometimes uh, almost like uh, 
I'd say a little bit like with WWE, if you, if your numbers as an athlete, just a general athlete across the board are substantial enough that that catches enough, uh, attention that, um, they'll find a, a place for you, so to speak, or they'll, they'll figure, they'll figure you out. Yeah. I, I actually liken it to, I mean, I guess you can say it's somewhat been controversial, but the discussion I'll say over how WWE handles, you know, their recruiting where mm -hmm. they bring in indie wrestlers that are proven that know how to, how to wrestle. I equate those guys to the football players that have great game tape. Yep. And then there's like the talent that they bring in, you know, like myself, where it's like, this guy's never wrestled a day in his life or his right. tape is minimal. He hasn't had that many matches, but He's a big guy. He's got some, you know, good friends. Right. He's strong. Maybe he's fast. Maybe he's good on the mic. We'll teach him the rest right. because we believe in our process. And, uh, you know, we'll see what shakes out from there. I'm, you know, maybe more willing to take a shot on this guy's intangibles than that guy's in ring or vice versa. That's exactly how the, the yeah. process becomes for those 32 teams. But, you know, each team looks at different scenarios. Yeah. I'm, I, and I'll be honest, I don't think I'm like, and the older I've gotten, like, I, I just, I don't think I'm mad at any of it. Like, however, somebody gets their opportunity, the opportunities are so few and far between, and they're so coveted sometimes, whether it be the NFL or it be WWE or whatever else. Like, um, I mean, I just, I, <laughs> this is a kumbaya moment for me, but like, I just would like to see other human beings succeed, you know? And it's like the, the internet can be so like social media can be so toxic. Just people oh. want to see other people fail because they're not doing what they want to do. But it's like, Man, I, I don't know. Uh, if you're an indie guy and you make it, great. If you're, um, you know, a, a scholarship football player and for whatever reason, like, you take to this, great. You know, whatever whatever's going to do it. Dude, I, I completely agree with you. And I just, I feel like I see the benefits more and more every year of having both on your roster, how everyone can benefit from each other. I mean, you can't have a Logan Paul and a Bad Bunny and a Pat McAfee come into WWE and bring what they can to there without like the guys that actually know how to wrestle and walk them through every single move for you right. know, so they can go out there and have a banger. And then everyone credits those guys of, oh, my goodness, they're absolutely incredible. It's like, well, you know, they wouldn't have been able to produce a match like that or a match at all if they didn't pair them up with guys that really know sure what they're doing and you know on the flip side of that too it's like well those wrestlers without those guys they can just have the normal you know wrestling pro wrestling audience um yeah which you know i hate to say has become a little more niche than it was back in the attitude era for sure or, say it or you can it's bring the truth. Other guys in and they bring espn with them and all the abc and all these other outlets and yeah. now your views that you're getting eyes on you are just more massive it's a perfect combination and there's just so yeah. much value to both yeah i i think that that's uh you know because i've been asked a couple times in in interviews and whatever about like the influencers um you know i i did a, a boxing match recently and um the whole Which influx awesome, of by the way Oh, thank you, sir. Um, but the whole influx of like the influencers getting these, you know, boxing matches and different fights and blah, blah, blah. And so one of the questions I've been fielding a lot is, you know, does that bother you? Or like when they come over to WWE and it's like, hell no, it doesn't bother me. You know, like maybe, I don't know, maybe uh, it would have bothered me when I was younger, maybe. But I don't even know if it would have then, but it's certainly at this point, like, no, I don't begrudge anybody having, if, if somebody wants to watch Logan Paul do a goddamn chemistry experiment and they're willing to pay money for it, like, oh, well, who am I to tell them how to spend their money? Like, cool. <laughs> and if he can benefit from it, great. Yeah. What do I care? Well, look yeah. at the, look at the add to era. The turning point was Mike Tyson coming in for that, that uh, WrestleMania. And that kind of turned the tide. 
yeah. in a way. You know? Who's Mike Tyson? You're <laughs> fighting. Next, you're, you're fighting him in a couple months. <laughs> yeah, he's your, yeah. he's, your he's your next match in February. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's get him high first. Please. All right. <laughs> as high as possible. Yeah. Oh, you're being bashful again. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. All right. So uh let's get back on track here. Um <laughs> so, yeah, so oh, Combine I, doesn't go well. Yeah, so I, I don't get to participate, so I don't get drafted. Um I knew it was gonna be a tough one to get drafted anyways, but with the, without the pro day, I knew there was no shot. So um I'm sitting around and I'm stressed out. I'm trying to figure out how this is gonna work because you go through all seven rounds, the multiple day process. And then what happens after that is the team sign undrafted free agents. So it's like, all right, we have more guys to sign. Um, we only had so many draft picks, but we do need more guys to fill out a camp roster. So we'll bring in extra dudes, see who sticks out of those guys. If we can walk away with one, two, three that actually make the team, that's great. So, um, I, I was hoping for one of those spots. I didn't even get signed to one of those. I was like, dude, what the hell? I thought for sure I'd le at least get a shot somewhere. Yeah. Um, then that night, uh, my agent calls me and he's like, good news and bad news. I was like, ah, oh, if there's any kind of good news today, <laughs> I'll fucking take it. My goodness. <laughs> he goes, the Packers want to bring you in for, uh, for camp, but you're a tryout player. That's the good and bad news. You, you got a shot, but you're a tryout player. And I was like, well, what are my odds? And what it ended up being was they were bringing in 25 guys to do mini camp with their team. Three days of practices, they're going to sign one, two, three, four, maybe at the end wow. of the day. So the odds are slim. And usually, sure. no, in football, it's like, if they don't need my position group, it doesn't matter how much I ball out because they're not yeah. going to take me. So I went in and I, I I just, I don't know, man, something inside told me, I was like, dude, all you need is a shot. You're going to figure it out from there. That was a story in college at Maryland. You're going to do the same here. And yeah, man, that's what I did. I went out there. I was loud as hell. I was vocal. I was sprinting everywhere. My, my MO is, you know, Bobby's show up in the best shape possible yeah. and with as much energy, never let anyone see you be tired. Never let them see you be upset and just fucking yeah. do your thing. And yeah. I went and I guess I didn't know this until later, but the, um, the coach called my agent after the first practice, like, don't tell your boy, but we've seen everything we needed to see today. We're going to oh, sign wow. you for the weekend. So. That's awesome. That's oh, awesome, man. I went through the next three days of practice, killing myself. Yeah. And I was like, man, I was hoping I'd get a shot at the, on the last day they pulled us out of the um, team dining hall. There was three of us actually. And they're like, you guys forgot to sign your, your, your waivers or your, you know, whatever paperwork. And I was like, uh, okay, whatever. We went upstairs and that's when they told us like, we're signing you three to a contract that's awesome. there and then I've, no sense of professionalism, no like. <laughs> yeah, that's right, I earned this contract, or thank you. It was like, <laughs> did you kiss him on the mouth? <laughs> I didn't do that. <laughs> I'm French, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know, Mojo. I mean, I, since I've met you, the enthusiasm's always been there and stuff. And and hearing that story, like to me, it's just confirmation that. Um, you know, with these opportunities, there's only so many things in life that we have control over. In fact, probably fewer than we even realize. But like that, you, like you're just one of those people that you you uh, take charge of what you are in control of, which is your attitude, your effort, et cetera, et cetera. Like those things you always have um, governor over. Um, and I think people get stuck in their own head and they get depressed and they get, you know, down. Um, and it just doesn't, it, it seems to me like you're one of those people or, or somebody that is able to curb that. Um, and, and there's something to be said for that alone. Yeah. For me, it was always like, 
attitude and effort are the two things that you can control effort even yeah. more so than attitude because i may i might have said that in reverse years back but i feel like now this is where my head is but you can't control where you are in the card you can't control how other no. people are going to treat you book you use you whatever all you can do is is show up and convince yourself that things aren't that bad that you're you're living it you're you yeah know, alive you're still surviving and thriving and uh yeah work as hard as you can because i know for me like i i never had any regrets anytime i was cut or fired from a team because it's like you know what i i did everything i, I can you sure know? they didn't take me after that you know it's it's their problem not mine and i i can live with the fact that you know i either couldn't cut it but i definitely did everything i could and it just was out of my hands so yeah that that was always my my kind of look and i i really did try to take that into to wrestling as well because you know that's even a much different case more unique case than, than football even is it's awesome you know it's um i think the word i'm looking for is subjective you know yeah. and, and it's uh so when your fate is in somebody else's hands like that like um I don't know. You, you're not doing yourself any favor to have a different um, attitude towards it than than that. It's, it actually made me think of. I'll have to go back and look, but Michael Chandler, um, he fights for the UFC. Um, oh yeah. He posted something on his Instagram today. I'll have to go back and look, um, but I only read the first couple of sentences, and then I, I got pulled away doing something. But it was something along those lines about adversity and being able to walk away from a situation knowing that um in earnest the effort that he put forth couldn't have been and there's it couldn't have been um any more and that there's satisfaction in that and that uh it was a very similar sentiment now i'm gonna have to go back and look when we get off of here to, to see what it was but like man those kind of things um I don't know. I'm all about those things. I, you know, uh, bleeding heart maybe, <laughs> but like, I love that kind of stuff. And, you know, dude, it's kind of one of those things too, because if I'm, you know, looking at, say I'm, I'm looking back at my wrestling career, it's like, oh, you know, I would have liked to have won the WWE championship or at least the IC title or, or something like that. It's like, well, I'm obviously, as we all are, close friends with people who have won those big titles 10 times 20 yep. times yeah they're not even happy with what they won you know it's like oh yeah. man i wish i could have had it one more time or yeah. one week longer i've been like one notch higher on the all-time titles wins or longest holding you know a tight whatever it's like you're never happy really with no. your career but if you can be happy with what you put out and what you could control then i, I feel like in the end that's more important I think you're right. I, I agree with that. I, th I think uh, there's it's always on to the next. And I think that that's how a lot of people um, who are successful, you know, end up that way is that you're always looking for the, the next hill to to conquer. Um, and it, it's kind of a never ending story in that way. Um, but yeah, just trying to find the uh, the satisfaction in in all of it, and I, I hate to be cliche about it, but it's like it really is uh, partially in the journey, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the stories and the memories you make along the way, and and then you realize, like, man, this is the the life that I'm living, or that I lived, or what, however you know, past tense or present tense or whatever. But like, man, that shit's pretty cool. Like I yeah. got to spend all this time here or, you know, I got to be at this and I, you know, it, it's, um, I don't know. I think we need to keep those things in perspective a little more than, than we do sometimes. Yeah. Those, those constant reminders help, you know, for sure. When you're going through it, no question about it. Yeah. Yeah. And then that's too, where like I get, cause, um, <laughs> I catch a ton of heat at, at the moment, it seems like, no. um, from the wrestling community. Like, there's things that we've said on this podcast, Mojo, that are as tongue-in-cheek as, as it could get. It's a, it's a joke. 
Like we talked about Frank and Dennis going to the Survivor Series, <laughs> and some dirt sheet picked it up. <laughs> but anyway, the the point being is just that like um, it just seems like <laughs> social media um, is another one of those things where uh, I just feel like some of the opinions and whatnot that are out there, it's like. You're following me, asshole. Yeah. <laughs> you <know? laughs> like, <yeah>. How are you burying <laughs> me when you know everything there is to know about my life and you follow me on all three platforms? And this right. And I'm just, I, you know, <laughs> I don't know. It's You know uh, what I do on social media, which I found to be a fun experiment over the fa- past like five to ten years is... When someone buries me online, unless like they say something with just too much obscene language or something that's like really pushing it too far, I'll I'll always like the comment. Yeah. <laughs> and it's it's kind of a subtle F you, but it's kind of sometimes I'm like, hey man, I I actually kind of value this opinion. You're right. I just kind of suck today. I agree. But <laughs> when you like the comment. Yeah, I've gotten multiple reactions before where it was like, holy crap, Mojo actually liked my comment. Dude, I didn't mean it like that. I swear right. you're actually one of my favorite wrestlers. I just I didn't like how this one thing went, but you're, you're still the man. And I've also gotten like Mojo's an idiot. He just liked my comment and I insulted him. <laughs> I think he's confused or he didn't mean to do it. And then. <laughs> Sometimes you get fans out of it. Like sometimes people are like, dude, yeah. I love the fact that you could like laugh at this and you know, you got a fan for life now or whatever it is. People like those people, when you like a comment by them, it's seems like such a minimalized, minute thing. It's like that means the world to some people. Just that little bit of gratification, I guess. I think for some of these people that in their real lives like nobody hears them (laughs) so they're just happy to be heard which is actually you know it's it's sad in a way like it makes me not um want to be aggressive about it It makes me more like feel sorry for them Um, yeah i what what i think gets me more than anything is just you know it, it it is pro wrestling We know what this is Um, and people get so fired up about it. And it's like, you know, I appreciate the passion, but at the same time, um, what the fuck are we talking about? (laughs) (laughs) Why are you so upset? (laughs) This is like, are you that angry that Tom Cruise did what he did in, you know, whatever uh, Mission Impossible. Like, I mean, what are we talking about, people? <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, and but you know, at the end of the day, without them, like nobody's paying to watch us um, jump around in our underpants. And you know um, what I think part of know. it is, and it kind of took me a little bit to figure this out. And I think it's maybe I've been able to articulate it a little better because now with you know, having the talent management company, we, we articulate these things a little bit to these, these brands, but wrestling fans are trained to know that their voice matters. So they know that since the show is scripted and that WWE compiles every like retweet comment, positive, negative reaction to every segment of every show. And there's literally a statistical report that's printed and analyzed for every production meeting. Um, I think they know that they should contribute and they should voice their opinion so that, you know, it alters the show because they know okay. their voice is being heard and, you know, factor that into the live events where them, you know, knowing all of our chants and singing along to our music and knowing yeah. to boo us, boo us, they're kind of cued in. So I think it all just goes hand in hand. I mean, as the, you know, WWE, like the tout, they have the most socially engaged platform sure. bar of any sport. Um, that kind of mentality is why, I think. So whether yeah. it's 
too bad. We just we get all of it because you know that's how the system works. Yeah, and and I, that's a great point. And that um, that like you you if that is the case, then you got to take the good with the bad. You know, it's like you get you get the sword either way. Um, and it just is what it is. Like the the fans, I one of the things I've noticed is like fans really seem to take ownership of some things when it comes to pro wrestling like they they don't in in other um arenas um i got released or uh i left aew and uh was between between contracts uh and uh so it was the first time in i don't even i definitely since i signed with wwe four years prior, whatever it was, um, I had become like the, the mustache had become like a signature thing, you know? And, um, so obviously when I was with WWE, like I, I wasn't allowed to shave it or whatever. Anyway, uh, so I'm between contracts, figuring it out. And I just, I don't know, I got a hair up my ass and I, I shaved, <laughs> I was clean shaven. That was the first time in, uh, God, I don't know, probably 15 years. And, um, I did an interview not long after it and people lost their minds and were like angry that I didn't have a mustache. Like, how dare I? It's like, it's my face. <laughs> They're literally the only one that might have a claim to you altering your look is a spouse. Like that's the only person that maybe can weigh in and right. everyone else. Yeah. Can't say a word to someone yeah. if you want a haircut or yeah. shaving a mustache or something. No way. <laughs> well, my daughter that was here earlier, um, she didn't look at me for like a week. <laughs> she would not look at me without a mustache. Because uh, I mean, her entire life that I've known her, she's uh, I, I've had you know a mustache. Dude, I've had facial hair since I was able to grow facial hair. Yeah. Both were you a young uh were you a young facial hair haver like everybody had those kids in like fifth grade that had a full mustache i wasn't that guy i okay. was ours was joe Gigenti. Joe <laughs> you remember him dennis yeah joe Gigenti. i i can't i'm saying it wrong but yeah he had, like like, he he had this he, uh people. i don't know how hairy he is now i have to ask his wife <laughs> but yeah full mustache we were in fifth grade yeah i think my seventh or eighth grade photo i had like my little pseudo peach fuzz mustache but you know a man wouldn't count it but a boy would kind of thing yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's funny how that happens for a man yeah. you know when you start to become it's awkward it's so weird it's so weird that whole process. Like I remember being so excited that I had armpit hair. Now I <laughs> now I shave my armpit. <laughs> yeah, me too. I still shave my arm hair. I haven't wrestled a match in like two and a half years. Yeah, <laughs> At this point, I, I still shave my arms for some reason. Whatever. I do the same. I thought that was the craziest thing. Like coming from football, like shaving my arms, shaving my chest, wearing little man panty underwear and going out in public and greasing <laughs> myself up with cocoa butter. I came in and I was like, dude, never. Nope. Not that guy. No chance. And then when in Rome. Arm sleeves wouldn't stay up if I had arm hair on. So the arm hair had to go. And then I realized <laughs> that when I do my crazy old, you know, stay hyped entrance, sliding in and out of the ring i would take off all the skin on my thighs if i didn't put cocoa butter on so i started greasing myself and then all of a sudden i'm full-blown wrestler with all it the all makes sense it all makes sense what the hell yeah <laughs> uh, all you need now is the vicodin <laughs> I was trying to search into my head. I was trying to think of the, like one of the brand names, but <laughs> I think Vicodin fits the bill, right? I don't know. Sure. I, that's one of the things I would I would say. Like um, our generation seems to be have way more of a handle on. 
Um, yeah. Just, just that whole scene. I mean, I know some of the boys that still, you know, do whatever they do. But uh, for the most part, I, I'd say it's like, you know, if you guys have a have a couple of drinks here and there, the, more than anything, you see a lot of weed. Yeah, that's it. That's I used to laugh, but I thought it was the funniest thing in the world how certain guys would just allocate fifty, a hundred thousand dollars, whatever, however much it was, knowing that they were gonna fail every piss test for weed and it was gonna be <laughs> yeah. fine. And they just knew, like, all right, yeah. this is my weed fund. I need it to get through this this career. Yeah. I'm just gonna pay it. And they'd come out and be like, damn it, just yeah. back, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's the truth. And I mean, you know, whatever, um, uh, I'm not here to judge anybody on it, you know, whatever gets you, uh, gets you through the day. And it's certainly far from, um, but, you know, back in the day and we've all heard the stories and we could rattle off the names and it's not worth it, but it's, um, yeah, it's scary what this industry, what used to be the norm. You know, I wonder too, if that's more, uh, because people don't want to anymore or if it's that they don't need to anymore. And what I mean by that is like, if there's more awareness and they've seen the deaths that happen when you pile up and stack too many of these things, or they at least know what to take and what amounts, or if it's just like, you know, nobody's doing double shots, you know, every single day, seven days a week, the schedule's yeah. lighter or not. You know, everyone's not cutting as much and doing all these things. Like a lot of moves are outlawed. Like guys are trained better and work safer now. So everyone's not as banged up and hurting now where they don't have yeah. to look at what to take to get through. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think it's a combination of, of uh, all of those things. Yeah. Um, and some people, you know, there are still a few that, that struggle with it and, uh, God bless them. Um, you know, it just the the ending of that story. It's uh, it's not not a good one. So I, like yeah. I said, I'm I'm just glad to see that you know the um, generation that uh, we came up with and the one that's coming after us. It seems that um, that stuff is kind of becoming more outside the box than uh, than inside. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> Boys, we got we got a, on a, a, wow. a totally different. <laughs> yeah. Uh, We've gone and, on a tangent literally <laughs> every talking point. And I think that's yeah. my fault. I, <laughs> no, no, it's, no, it um, is not. no, it's not. <laughs> so, Frank, I I would think we, we are now. Um, are we ready for WWE talk or do we want to tie up the loose end? That was the, uh, the NFL for you, Mojo. Like what? Give us did, a, give us a this... good NFL story. Okay. Give us a good NFL story. Uh, give any category in particular. Anything that the platform's yours. Okay. Um, I was a big hit in Green Bay, but for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> Every time we would go out, first of all, Green Bay in the offseason, not the best place to be. There is, at least, I mean, maybe it's different now. This was 2009, but there was, like, nothing to do there. So, like, for the Rook, right. the veterans flew home every week. Green Bay would structure practices Tuesday through Thursday so the veterans could fly home, you know, for, for four days. The rookies, we were broke. We had to stay put. We had no money. Right. So, like, we were always trying to find something to do. So we used to go out in Green Bay and, you know, like, go out party. And I, I didn't drink or anything back then, but I'd go out with the boys to hang out. And I don't know who the people of Green Bay thought I was. <laughs> but no matter what bar we went into, every chick in there threw herself at me. Okay. Every dude in there wanted my autograph. And All I was right. like, I am an undrafted rookie. I made this team <laughs> on a freaking tryout, which is literally the last spot on the totem pole of how you make an NFL team. Yeah. Who the hell do they think I am? And I could <laughs> not figure it out. In the end, we had an offensive guard named Darren College who um, 
incredible player. I think they thought I was him, but I never got <laughs> I didn't ever, you know, I didn't even tell him this story, but literally it was every freaking time we went out and like the rookies, we'd have first round draft picks. We had two that year and they would be like, we're not going out. It was Dean back then. We're not going out unless <laughs> Dean comes too. And I had a girlfriend, so I just like try and like funnel the chicks to those guys, you know? Right. It was just the most confusing thing. I mean, in later years, I would have killed to have that kind of attention. But sure. <laughs> Timing's everything. Yeah. <laughs> well, if I ever get booked in Green Bay, I know yeah. who I'm going to try to get booked alongside. I lost all my football weight. I don't think I have to feel anymore. <laughs> Mojo Rowley's probably yeah. way less popular than whoever they thought I was. <laughs> hmm. Okay, so... NFL uh, closing one door uh, closes, another one opens, uh, so to speak. How, do, how does how does WWE find its way onto your radar? I mean, obviously, you were a fan, Ultimate Warrior, etc. But you're an adult. You're a bill paying adult, <laughs> professional life. Um, how does this come together? How did um, you find? Did you find WWE? Did they find you? A bit of both. So. I, I just had written off, you know, years ago, like, I, you know, I wanted to be a wrestler as a kid, you know, now, how old was I? 25, 26. Yeah, probably 25 when I started. And uh, I just assumed that that ship sailed. I didn't know anything about the process. I hadn't even really thought about it because I thought it was just, you know, it was done. Um, but I had an injury with the Cardinals that led to, to me being done there. I was home rehabbing, and when I came back, I was starting to see, like, you know, let, let's see who I can play for next, like who I can get a shot for. Um, I was talking to the Jets and the Raiders, I believe, when I was just hanging out with the Gronkowski family. Again, I had, you know, made buddies with uh, the rest of the brothers outside of Dan and Chris from Maryland and their dad, and – we kind of had like WWE on. We were watching Raw or SmackDown. Something I don't remember. I was gonna um, say, are the, are the Gronks wrestling fans? They 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 love to watch it. They're not like okay. diehards, um, but you know they they get way more into it going to a show than watching it, which is probably sure anybody. But they always got a kick out of it, and they definitely oh, cool. watched when they were younger. Um, cool. We come to find out watching it because one of them was like, yo, Dean, you should definitely go into wrestling. You're perfect for it. And I was like, <laughs> I would love to do that. Who the hell are we going to call? Like, come on. I don't know anything about this process. I didn't even know about, like, independence, the circuit, how to get in. I knew nothing. Yeah. And uh, the, the, their dad is sitting right there, and he goes, I'll make a call for you. I was like, well, who are you going to call? And he's like, <laughs> I was calling college- <laughs> I was college roommates with Mike Rotunda at Syracuse. He's one of their coaches. Holy shit. shit. Yeah, I was like, oh, hell yeah. So he calls them up. We went to a show in Buffalo where the Gronks were from. They were just so happened uh, they were coming to town soon. And I went. I met with um, with Mike backstage. We had a conversation. He introduced me to Ryback was there. Um, I saw Dolph Ziggler wrestle a live event. He made – one of the most hilarious comments I had ever heard. We popped huge. It was a live event, so you know how we get on live events. Yeah. yeah. TV. He hands his ring coat to the ref, and he goes, don't get – and he's yelling it, obviously playing to the crowd, but he goes, don't give this coat to anybody, not even kids with cancer. You know? <laughs> <laughs> dude, we popped huge. Dude. That's a we true were, heel right there. Healed it up big time. <laughs> Knowing Dolph now, it just makes it – yeah. That much better, you know, because of how funny he can be. Um, yeah. But, yeah, dude, I was, like, seeing it in person. I was like, that mm. was my first ever in-person live event. I was like, this is leagues better than what I watched as a kid. And, sure. Mike was, you know, we're going to send you in for a tryout. I had a conversation with them. They ended up not sending me on a tryout. All they did was have me go to Raw in my home, you know, in D.C., which is closest to my hometown. And I met with William Regal cut a pro promo for him backstage and they signed me off of that. No in ring. Oh, cool. like, back then the process was different, but they're like, dude, you, you're coming from the NFL. Yeah. You're fine physically. Like, yeah. you know, yeah, we know I'm you, 
you're uh, coordinated and we, and, and that's a thing, you know, as a professional athlete. And that's one of the things that like people can get their panties in a bunch, uh, you know, the independent guys saying like, Oh, well, these college athletes, blah, blah, blah. But like, and then that's why I say like, I don't know, whatever the, the vehicle is to get in, like, I'm not mad at it for, mm-hmm. for anybody, whether it be independence or it, it be, um, you know, coming from college athletics or whatever, like at least in that vein, they know like, okay, well, this guy's coordinated and he's not going to be a disaster in that way. Like we can teach him. Yeah. And that's the thing too, with the indie guys, um, you know, and, and I would probably fall more into that category. Uh, but like guys can come in with bad habits. Guys can come in having been trained poorly and, yeah. and those bad habits can be harder to break than, you know, so there's a different, that, that's what they told us when we were coming in. They're like right now for where they were in the recruiting process, it was, we're, we're very high on that right now. I don't know if they just had a couple of guys come in with bad habits that yeah. they couldn't break or refused to break. Um, but they're like, dude, dude, we just want to, you know, grab some guys from scratch. So they brought in three of us from the NFL at the same time. It was me, uh, Baron Corbin, and this other guy who was wrestling under the name Attack. Um, but Baron and I actually played together in Arizona very briefly. Um, and we were buddies out there. And we, I don't know who called the other first, but we were randomly just doing like a, a catch-up call. Like, oh, man, well, you know what you've been up to? And. Right. Like, dude, I just signed with WWE. And the other one goes, dude, you're kidding me. I just <laughs> signed with WWE. And it, was, it was that quick and ridiculous. Um, and we got in completely through different people. Sorry, I'm just letting my dog out of this room real quick. He always sits with me while I film. But uh, all good, you know, man. We, we got in on completely different, um, you know, ways through different contacts, had no idea. And then we ended up starting together. And that was yeah. <laughs> Only in pro wrestling, you know, it's like the, there are no rules when it comes to this industry. It truly and is. Baron Corbin was a teammate of Pat McAfee's too. Yeah, so Baron played for uh, the Colts first oh. with with Pat, and then he came to the Cardinals second, which, you know, is, is also what I did. Well, small crazy. world. Yeah, crazy. I mean, small world when you think about it. Like, uh, Pat – uh corbin you and you've all come through wwe in uh, some shape or form um as well as the nfl like that's good stock yeah good man stock. It was fun fun times it was, that transition though is uh was very different wasn't at all what i was expecting i suppose yeah i didn't expect the mental game to be so severe i mean in, if there was probably one thing I could have gone back and changed about my career, I would have said um, I would have done. I would have spent a little less time trying to be in the best cardio shape humanly possible and be as strong as I was. And going back to the PC to like try and break the records every week that the the NXT crew was putting up while I was on the road. And I I was getting in ring and I was watching tape, but I probably should have gone about that process a little different because physically I always felt like I was good to go. I had my competitive advantage, but it's like mentally I, I needed to, I needed to do more there to keep up with guys that have been doing this for so much longer. That was, that would have been the big change up I would have made. Yeah. I, I think it's natural for guys that come from athletic backgrounds and whether they end up you know doing uh, some time on the indies or not like you just you fall back on what helped you be successful um it's a comfort zone one and and two it's that's what made you successful in this other thing and this thing is different but it's similar so why wouldn't you you know gravitate to what you know like i don't think um you know, it's, it's an odd thought to, to like throw yourself into being physically prepared because that's what made you uh, successful at, at playing football. Like, yeah. Makes total sense to me. And there were things I know for myself after 20 years in, in the industry, um, just 
my beliefs on the industry have changed over the years. And I know, you know like years through 10, I probably thought of pro wrestling much more like athletics and much more similar to the same sort of headspace where now I think they're so different. You know, if you go out and you're going to compete to me, whether it be football, kickboxing, boxing, whatever it is, if I'm competing, I have one focus. So like if it's a football game, I mean, I might need to remember the audible, you know, if, if the tight end is on the left instead of the right or blah, blah, blah. But those things I can kind of keep track of. Um, but my focus is still like to beat you, to hurt you, yeah. to whatever you want to call it. Pro wrestling, it's that's what I find is the biggest difference. It's spinning plates. You're spinning five plates. Then you get in the ring and, you know, we add two more. And so now you're spinning seven plates and then something goes wrong. The top rope breaks or something. And now you're spinning 10 plates. And it that's the anxiety for me, even after 20 years of, of doing it, is um, it's the spinning of all the plates. And, and yeah. sometimes I think I missed. And like now, I think sometimes I miss that like single minded purpose that competition provides that that pro wrestling being performance that's that's the contrast to me and sometimes i you know and i mean i love them both um but i guess you know on monday i want to compete and on tuesday i want to perform i don't know <laughs> you know that's dude that's yeah that's spot on for sure yeah it, what a difference. <laughs> yeah. And it just, you know, it's like the other thing too, I think is um, when you come from a competitive background and uh, it's not like the wins and losses and whatnot, you learn quickly in this business. Um, you know, it is like, I always took pride, especially like, let's say in our NXT run that we were, uh you know in in the undisputed era like we were the guys that were getting guys reps that needed them you know and and we were we were making people look good because we were workhorses and that was something that we were good at so i always kind of took pride in that but as an athlete and maybe you can relate to this too there are times where you end up with people that are just not coordinated and not this and not that but I, you know at the end of the day like it's the guy with the pencil deciding and then that starts to affect your bottom line sometimes because you know it's not about the wins and losses but if you put over everybody then eventually you putting somebody over doesn't mean anything yeah that so, and that was always the tricky part it's like man it is tricky if they if they don't want you to succeed or at least giving you give you a small opportunity to succeed you're just you're just not going to you know yeah uh, whereas like you go out in a football game if you're playing defensive end and you have four sacks that game even if you were a backup or you only got four plays that game they will make sure you yeah can't stop you from from at least no. getting your next opportunity because now yeah. The fans see that. The owner sees that. That's coming from the top. Doesn't matter if the head coach thinks you're the biggest scumbag on the planet. Right. He's getting superseded here. So wrestling, yeah. of course, is just so subjective. Yeah, that, that was always a tough one for sure. So I think it's difficult for a guy who who is, um, you know, generally what we talked about before. Like you're you're going to have a positive attitude, and you're going to give the effort, and you're going to control what you can control. But then you run head first into this pro wrestling thing and you hit a wall that is different because um, you can control what you can control, but that still doesn't mean the outcome is going to change. Yeah. You know, it, it, and that, that, that can be, uh, that can be difficult, you know, but I, I, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, <sighs> shit man we pretend to fight in our underwear like it's a charmed life boy <laughs> I'll tell you. frank did i uh burst your bubble a little bit yeah 
<laughs> I have a feeling that you burst a lot of people's bubbles considering <laughs> what I read online. So yeah, if you're there's a lot of people going, going no, it isn't. It. No. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So WWE Mojo, your uh how long were you with the company? Just under 10 years total, actually. Holy oh, shit. Oh, wow. Nice. Yeah. Wow. Started in 2012. Uh, wow. Yeah, July. It's 2022. 20. That's crazy. Whoa, yeah. whoa, it is? No, Frank. Not for long. No, go back to sleep. <laughs> Put my scarf back on. <laughs> 10 years. That's, a, that's shit. 10 years. That's a decade, Frank. That's what they call that. Wow. wow. Nice. Man, you are dropping some knowledge tonight. I am. I yeah, am. He's on fire today. Bursting yeah. bubbles and swimming upstream and, <laughs> you know, doing all the stuff. Tell them, Dennis. Tell that what? internet to go shove it up their ass. There you go. Yeah. See, I didn't even have to tell them. You told them. There we go. There we go. Um, Frank? Yeah, guy. Where uh, where shall we where shall we steer this ship? Let's talk about how you are the ninety five time twenty four seven champion. <laughs> <laughs> Is that true? Ninety five? No. <laughs> no, that's our truth. That won it probably literally ninety five times. Yes, <laughs> I think it was like seven times. But I mean, we exaggerate a little bit. Yeah, that was fun, man. Look, I I was pretty uh. There it is. Pretty excited about that one because I had pitched an idea because I could, I mean, we all could feel it. I mean, everyone could feel it, that it was getting a little stagnant, uh, a little stale. They were doing the same gigs too much. So yeah. I went in and I pitched to Vince, um, kind of making it more like uh, the hardcore title, uh, making it a little more serious, a little more legitimate, a little more rugged and badass i wanted to be the first guy that wasn't gonna run and hide and try and evade everyone and the whole right. goofy trotting line of us chasing each other all throughout the short show randomly yeah. and be like look I, I got this thing i'm ready to stand and fight i'm ready to do what this title's about like let's let's have the, you know no dq matches with it hardcore all throughout the stadium like let's get creative with this thing let's have matches in las vegas casinos let's have matches that you know yeah, the supermarket. We no one should go there after Stone Cold Booker T. That was the table. But uh, you know, like let let's let's get out there with this thing. Let's mix it up, and you know, I supply like a list of places we could go to where it would be free that we could shoot. You know, whatever. And and Vince loved the idea, so um, we we ran with that, and you know, exchanged it a few times. I think in the end, I had it like seven times total, which. Uh -huh. so funny you, you win it you lose it 10 seconds later you win it back 10 seconds later literally that's three <laughs> title reigns which uh, you know whatever but yeah. uh, they were pretty high on the, that idea and we started to set it up and then they called up uh riddick moss from or madcap moss now yeah. t and he was going to uh kind of get in on that as another like former football player big numbers yeah. guy, big jack straw i was just team. gonna say another guy with ridiculous numbers dude yes ridiculous. It, it, i was like i was always upset like i i got called up you know while he you know when he got going in nxt i was like this could have been my training partner this <laughs> yeah. Time. yeah like this we could have really pushed Ooh. each other here but uh we, we had a really cool plan. We were going to go into Mania with it, me, him, and Truth. And, um, you know, that's when actually we decided to uh, bring Rob Gronk back in the mix uh, from football and did that whole thing. And, and Mania is the time to do it. You know, that's the most eyes. Yeah. And the company loves that, you know, um, to bring in those non-hardcore you know, wrestling audience. That's, and that's just good business, you know? Yeah. And, and that's where I give you credit too, man, because when things are going a way that like, you don't necessarily see them going, most people, you know, they, they either pack it in or they, their boo-boo face or their whatever, like, but 
having been in the system and, and seeing it and being in pro wrestling for, you know, 20 years, um, it's, if you don't try and you don't, you know, keep going to them with ideas, like yeah, you're never going to get an opportunity. And, and it, again, it's controlling the things that you can control. Like you can go to them with ideas and you can contain your frustration or you can be boo-boo faced over it and um you know fuck yourself dude fandango actually gave me some of the best advice i've ever gotten in the business and he he was just saying it's not about who wins the most titles and who has the best runs here and there but he was like it's about who who can last the longest how long can you survive because he's like yes you're gonna be you might be a jobber in the most embarrassing way for two, three, five, six years. But eventually the fans are going to notice that they're going to respect the fact that you hung in the, the office is going to see that they're right. going to appreciate it. They're going to know that they have a soldier on their hands and you will eventually get your run. And if you look at all the guys that were fired and came back and their first run was a joke, I guess I'll say, for lack of a better term. And then the yeah. second one was everything they possibly could have dreamed uh, that it was. It's just a, a testament to that, like just just enduring and just rolling with it. And yeah. to your point that you just said, we're getting paid to travel the world with our yeah. buddies and joke around and yeah. pretend to fight each other on our underwear and TV. It's like, yeah. this is, even if you're a job guy, like this is still a great gig, you know, like it's, you just well, got to remember that. I mean, that's part of the thing that gets me with like people who support this industry, you know, from a fan perspective, but they're so quick to give their, Oh, well that guy fucking sucks. And, you know, and it, it, earlier in this podcast, I kind of did it myself. I, I brought up Brooklyn brawler and, you know, like it's easy to, to poke fun at those things. But at, at the same time, like what the fuck are you doing? Yeah. You know? And, 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 I don't even mean to come down on you for like, well, what the fuck are you doing? But I'm just saying it's more of like, it's a charmed life. It, it really is. And you get to do something in the public eye and work for this great company and people know who the fuck you are. And like, like, you know, it could be much worse, yeah. you know, it could be so much worse. And in fact, for, for lots of people, it is much worse. Dude, you know? even with Brooklyn Brawler, he had an office job with WWE after yeah. the fact. So yeah. it's like when you look at the at the end of the day of your full run and everything you got to do, it's like the wins and losses are not the most important thing on the resume. There's so much no. more valuable things in the in the works here. It's uh, you really learn to to prioritize it because yeah i mean you know coming in as an athlete it's like nope i want to be the champion i want to be the highest paid i want to be right. the guy who's front and center on the the poster i want all of these things and it's like you realize these are not the most important you know elements you you really find no. out what's the most special it does become a bit of a slippery slope just because you know you do come from an athletic background and you want to be those things but you you figure out that getting good at this job is is being good at the trade and knowing how to do the trade and there's something to be said for that but then i'll balance that with you know if you put everybody over then putting people over doesn't you know so it's a balance it just yeah. is what it is absolutely yeah all right well um, gentlemen, I think we're, uh, let's take us home. Let's take, that was fun. Yeah, we're hitting that 90, <laughs> almost 90 minute mark. <laughs> um, this, but I knew this was going to be, uh, this was going to be, uh, there was going to be no, uh, loss of words here. Yeah. Mojo, um, I know can go and, and, uh, and I, I can go in the right uh, scenario too. So. Um, Dude, I had to come on this, bro. You came on a TMZ Sports with me, and of course, for that that interview was was awesome. Everybody, yeah. Loved it. I was like, dude, I gotta, I gotta pay back the favor here, man. Well, sure. I'll let you know too. Uh, Global Titans, I'm supposed to be fighting again for them. Um, it was said maybe late February, early March, but um, 
I mean, with that TMZ credential, I uh, I think there's got to be some room maybe in this next contract where I say, hey, listen, I got I got to have my guy from TMZ uh, with me. And <laughs> his, a- his wife, he can't go anywhere without his wife. Yeah. So. <laughs> Who knows? Who and knows? neither bring can the I. mojo. Bring the mojo. <laughs> right. right. So we're gonna to cut a promo, baby. Yeah, yeah. So uh with any luck, uh Mojo, you and I will be heading over with uh both of our wives and uh we'll see what happens over there. Dude, awesome, man. I can't wait for that. That's gonna be sick. And again, yeah. dude, it's it's awesome to see what you've been able to accomplish, you know, before, during, and after. Um my goodness, bro, that last fight was had us all hyped up, and we can't, uh, can't wait for the next one. I appreciate the support, man. I, I like I had said before, I just that itch to like compete, man. It's a tough one to get out of your system. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure I mean, it ever goes away. I don't think so. I don't yeah. think so. <laughs> <laughs> all all right. right. Well, on that note, uh, Dennis. Frank? I got I nothing, up. Papa. <laughs> He's still <laughs> stuck you, on she. the Iron Sheet. Can we talk Thank about you, real she. quick how Mojo's wearing a Macho Man tank top? and he has <laughs> a gla- If you put those glasses on, you literally look like your shirt. <laughs> Brother, this is my work attire. Hell yeah. This is my work outfit. I wear no sleeves, the Mojo chain, and the Pit Vipers. I'm, that's it. Oh, right. nice. I didn't realize you were in uniform. Yeah, I work uniform. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on real quick. I don't want to keep anybody, but um, I got a uniform of my own on here. Oh, yeah. You're going to really appreciate this one. <laughs> oh, please. Yeah. Who's that? <laughs> yep, there it is. All <laughs> right. So I got it. I'll come back on again. We all four wear the, the horse head while we're sitting on toilets for the next yeah. podcast. That is the move. <laughs> there you go. I, I can see this on TMZ. <laughs> I'm gonna wear that thing. I'm gonna order them for sure as soon as we get off. No question. All right, perfect. Mojo, thanks for coming on, man. This Thank was a you. blast. Awesome. Needless Thank to you. say. Thanks for having me, fellas. Part the fun. Seriously, yes. fun. I'm always on to come back for sure. Yeah, please. Right. We will set that up tomorrow. We'll have yeah, you back you on go. tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Talk All right, Bobby, say good night. Or say good night, Bob. However the fuck the saying goes. Come on, Dennis. Come on. You gotta, I got to. I got on. one line in all Please. this. Shit yeah, I just a softball. Line. Just put it up there. Just say good night, Bobby. Good night, Bobby. <laughs>